सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली टूडेज एपिसोड ऑफ कर्तक लेटर इज ओ टू टू पीसेज ऑफ फाइन वर्क डन बाई माई कोलीग्स सो दिस इज निखिल रामपाल और डेटा जर्नलिस्ट and also tca sharad ragman our economics editor each one is done a story that that gives me a lead into today's episode of cut the clutter so let me first of all ask you a question a trick question if you may ask me which ones do you think are the richest countries in asia asia i said richest countries in asia right you might immediately think of saudi arabia qatar uae the big oil economies right or maybe singapore the financial capital of asia and of a lot of the world particularly after the decline of hong kong or relative decline of hong kong etc etc but does the name of a country called israel come to your mind then if i told you that israel in fact today is not only the third richest country in asia the third richest after singapore which is basically a one city state with a lot of expats and a kind of financial capital so singapore then qatar which 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 is almost entirely an oil and gas economy singapore qatar and then israel so so you look at this graphic it shows you how israel is the third richest country in asia when you say country is richest or poorest or where it, where does it belong you always look at per capita incomes otherwise the country with the largest economy will will always be the biggest that is america but no america is the biggest economy not the richest country in the world so if you look at the richest countries in the world in asia israel is now number 3 in the middle east in the middle east israel is now number 2 after qatar once again counter intuitive you will say oh how can israel with not a drop of oil be richer than saudi arabia in fact at this point israel is twice as rich as saudi arabia and that's where some bit of the clutter for today's episode lies at how come a country with almost no natural resources in fact no natural resources except for the cosmetic salts they might dig out of the out of the dead sea right and sell it as cosmetics they have almost no natural resources and yet that country has now become so rich so if you look at the per capita incomes today singapore is 91000 in asia qatar is 83.9000 and israel is 55 plus 1000 in fact if you look at israel now it is twice as much as saudi arabia without any oil it's also several times bigger than its neighbors 11 times bigger than say jordan with which it has fought two wars 13 times richer than lebanon but lebanon is a fading power lebanon has a lot of other trouble so see what has led to this what has led to this miracle in israel once again if you want to understand the success of israel today israel's per capita income is higher than that of many top european oecd countries so it's higher than that of uk germany france and so on so how has this miracle happened look at israel and as i speak you will see some of these graphics you've already seen the graphic of comparisons of israel's per capita gdp in asia but also see where israel has come from so israel was a broken economy say until the mid 80s until 1985 israel used to have sort of zimbabwean scale or venezuelan scale inflation rates 450% was the peak in 1985 and that's when when i first went to israel in 1991 I was told oh this is the country where they keeps knocking off zeros from the value of their currency that was a shekel right 1985 they had the peak of that inflation peak inflation really broken economy shortages and a big welfare economy then the politics of the country changed and the economy of the country changed between 1985 and 86 the country carried out a big stabilization plan bankrolled by the americans under the reagan administration and you would expect that 
Ronald Reagan would then say, look, carry out economic reforms and I will give you money, conditional on economic reforms. So Israel carried out those economic reforms and that led to a massive change immediately. So from 450% in say 1985, Nikhil's story tells you, I'm sharing a link with you and you're seeing these graphics as we talk. You will see from 1985, from nearly 450%, it drops to about 20% and keeps going down. It has come under such tight discipline that for two decades now, for more than two decades now, Israel's inflation has stayed in single digits and that has made a big difference. Again, public debt to GDP ratio in 1985 had gone to 157% as an IMF working paper that Nikhil quotes from tells us. But then again, Israelis worked on that. How did they do it? First of all, they cut a lot of their welfare spending. They cut a lot of their welfare spending. They spent, they invested in infrastructure. They invested in human resources, but they cut a lot of their welfare spending. Second, they devalued their currency. I know that this is the era of currency nationalism, which will feature, which is a fact that will feature in the second part of this episode of Cut the Clutter. That is, that draws from TCA Sharad Raghavan's story. So currency nationalism, they dropped all notion of currency nationalism. They devalued their currency heavily and made their currency more competitive. As a result, see how Israel's per capita incomes traveled. Again, if you look at this IMF working paper, in 1986, Israel's per capita income, very small population, even now it's just about a crore of people. It was $8,000. 1996, it had come to $20,000 and today, as I told you, it's about $58,000. That is how the country's income levels have changed. Now, what does, what does Israel do that has brought about such a change? So, even in 1996, in the first, de first decade of its stabilization program, Israel was already spending 2.6% of its GDP in research and development. How much was that in 1996? If you want to understand that, that was more than what the Americans were spending as a percentage of their GDP. And you might say, oh, America's GDP is so large, so comparisons don't apply. Look at China. What Israelis were spending on R&D in 1996, that is 2.6%, was already five times, already more than five times of what the Chinese were spending in that year, right? So they were so far ahead of the Chinese already, so forward looking and so much so looking in the future. So they were making an investment in research, science, technology, high tech. Today, Israel's investment in research and development is 5.6% of their GDP. It is the highest in the world. And again, look at the other side of the figures. That tells you the benefit they've drawn from this. The benefit they've drawn from this is that their exports of high-tech products have boomed. So Israel has now become a superpower, a chota superpower in high-tech exports. Once again, what are high-tech exports? So if you look at the definition from UN Comtrade, which is the repository of global trade statistics, they tell you that high-tech exports or high-tech goods are products with high research and development intensity, such as aerospace, computers, pharmaceuticals, scientific instruments, and electrical machinery. It is these products where Israel's exports have boomed. So 2007, Israel's high-tech ex exports were $3.12 billion. That was 8% of Israel's manufactured goods exports. In 2008, next year, it went up to $10 billion or 17% of Israel's manufacturing exports. 2009 to 14 in five years, it went up but stayed around 20% of 20% share of Israel's total manufactured exports. By 2019, it had gone up to 23%. In 2021, Israel's high-tech exports were about $17 billion worth, which makes it one-third of all of Israel's exports. That is a massive jump and that is where these incomes of the Israelis are coming from. Now, I told you that 5.6% of GDP as spending on R&D is the highest in the world. You might also be curious to know what are the other countries spending? What, what are the other highest spenders in that field? So, usual suspects, South Korea 4.9% and Taiwan 3.8%. Those are the competitors, but Israel has stayed ahead of them. In fact, as we speak now, and as Professor Tomer Fadlon of Tel Aviv University quoted, quoted by Nikhil in his story, 
tells us that Israel today accounts for one third, one third of all the cyber security exports in the entire world. So think Pegasus, but it isn't just Pegasus. The Israelis rule the cyber security market. Now that reminds me of something that Thomas Friedman wrote once. He said, you Indians should not worry that you don't have so many natural resources, that you haven't got oil, you haven't got gold, you haven't got those resources, but you got people, you got human resources. So just as other countries mine their land for minerals, etc., you mind the minds of your own people. You mine your own people. That's precisely what Israel has done. So once again, lesson for India as well. If you want to be a knowledge economy, then invest in R&D, education, quality education, higher education. Already the share of high-tech goods in India's manufactured goods exports is about 10%. It's not too bad, but it could be better. But it is possible that some of it is weighed down also by our pharma exports. So I don't know how tech they are or whether generics are a part of this or not. But the fact is that a country like India, which sees itself as a big IT and technology power, should be producing and exporting a lot more of high-tech goods. So that is the lesson from Israel that I think we should learn in India as well. And the other issue we talk about is, again, currency and nationalism. So we've talked about this in the past. We've talked about the excitement now in some circles that oh, rupee would now become an international currency, that a de-dollarization is taking place, and rupee will now move into some kind of a globally traded currency, or there will be a BRICS currency, to which, and this is opinion, to which my view has been that a BRICS currency, an SEO currency, whatever, will then be a yuan-based currency. It will be a Chinese-led currency. India is not quite ready yet to float the rupee as a global reserve currency or the currency of global trade because that causes a problem. The problem is somebody can buy stuff from India in rupees. India can pay somebody in rupees. But what will that somebody do with those rupees? Can that somebody then buy, say, fighter planes from America or France with those rupees. It doesn't work like that. In fact, in practical life, that's precisely what's happening right now between India and Russia. We've spoken about this in the past, and I will share a link of that episode of Cut the Clutter with you. That, that is where Denis Manturov, the Russian Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Industry and Trade, had come to India, and he had underlined a problem. And he said, we just have too many rupees. You are buying this oil from us. You are paying us in rupees, but we don't know what to do with the rupee because there isn't that much for us to buy from your country. Unlike, say, the case with China. With China, the Russians have a lot to buy. So anything that the Chinese pay in yuan to them for their oil, China and India are the two biggest buyers of Russian oil now. Anything the Chinese pay in yuan, Russians are able to use to buy more stuff from China, but they don't have that much to buy from India. In the process, because of the increasing trade imbalance between India and Russia, given the rising oil imports, remember, India's oil imports from Russia before the war began were just $2.47 billion in a year. Last year, 2022-23, these had already come up to $31.12 billion. Again, see this graphic. So this is a rise of 1100% in one year. In fact, oil imports from Russia were just 2% of India's basket of oil and gas imports from the entire world. Now it's gone to 19. What's happened in the process is that in 2021-22, whereas in 2021-22, India's trade imbalance or trade deficit with Russia was $6.6 .6 billion. In 2022-23, it had come up to 43 billion dollars. It's not as if it's adding to India's entire trade deficit. It's just that this deficit has been shifted, say, from Saudi Arabia or Iraq or the US, other such countries from where India was buying oil earlier. So the overall deficit is netted off against this. But deficit with Russia is problematic for India and for Russia for the simple reason that while India can pay Saudi Arabia, Iraq, the US, the usual usual suppliers to India or UAE in dollars, in dollars or any of the other convertible currencies, say the UAE dirham, India cannot pay the Russians in dollar because there are there are sanctions on the dollar. So how does India pay? And if India pays in rupees, those rupees are piling up into a big 
mountain and Russians don't know what to do with it. What, so what the Russians have been telling the Indian side is that, look, we understand the problem and we don't want you fighting with this and that, nor do we want you breaking the sanctions. But can you pay some of it in a currency that we can use? Now, for some time, India was using dirhams to do so. But remember, dirham is also a dollar-linked currency. And there are limitations to what the Russians can buy with the dirham also because they can't convert it into the dollar while dirham itself is a dollar linked currency. So that's why the Russians, they haven't pushed for it, but they suggested to the Indian side that can you pay us some, some of it back in yuan. And lo and behold, Reuters had a story on this some time back and then we thought we'll check on it and that's how Sharad Raghman's story came in. See Sharad Raghman's story on your screen and we found out that about 10% value of our oil purchases from Russia, now we are paying back to the Russians in Chinese Yuan. Where does this Yuan come from? I don't know. If we are using our dollars to convert this into Yuan, that will be tough because that I'm not a 100%, but that might be seen as a violation of sanctions. I'm not a 100% on this. But the fact also is that officials tell Sharad that since we also export quite a bit to China, we have a deficit, but we still export quite a bit to China. Some of that is paid for in Yuan. And that Yuan is now being used to pay the Russians at least to the equivalent of 10% of all our oil imports. So once again, it's a reality check on the idea of currency and nationalism. So it's not as if rupee is becoming an internationally traded currency yet. Rupee is not ready yet for that. There is still time for that. On the other hand, because piled up rupee has become such a problem even between two friends like India and Russia. So what is the result? India is having to lean back on the yuan, the currency of the Chinese. Never mind, never mind our super friendly relations with our northern neighbor.